Yep. Well, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, I want to welcome you to uh, the Center for the Study of Africa and the African Diaspora's uh, webinar. <clears throat> We are focused on the theme, global, global Africa's quest for freedom, liberation in the modern period. My name is Mike Gomez. I'm the director of, of the center and I am delighted to welcome uh, to the forum three distinguished scholars. Uh, I will introduce them very, very briefly in an al alphabetical order and then we will uh, launch into our discussion and uh, we will leave 15, 20 minutes or so uh, toward the end of the session for you to, um, to, to entertain your questions or wh whatever interventions you may, have, you may have for the panelists. Uh, we're delighted to have Professor Monique Badesi, who is an Associate Professor of History in African and African American Studies at Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, uh, among her publications is Ja Kingdom, Rastafarian, Rastafarians, Tanzania, and Pan-Africanism in the Age of Decolonization, published uh, by the University of North Carolina Press in 2017. We are also delighted to have Professor Numata Blyden, who is an Associate Professor of History and International Affairs at George Washington University in Washington, D.C. Among her publications is African Americans in Africa, a new history that was published in 2019 by Yale University Press. Uh, last but not least, we have Professor Ben Talton, who is a professor of history and the director of the Moreland Spring Arn Research Center at Howard University. Uh, among his writings is In This Land of Plenty, Mickey Leland and Africa in American Politics, published in 2019 uh, by University of Penn. Uh, Pennsylvania Press. Thank you so much, uh, panelists, for for joining for joining us this afternoon. And uh, we're talking about this subject of of global Africa's quest for freedom and liberation in the modern period. Uh, I'd like to begin with the question: Is there an African diaspora or diaspora canon? That is to say, this is a you know, a way of entering into the conversation about the about the scholarly literature as it pertains to uh, to the African diaspora, as it pertains to this whole question of global Africa's freedom, uh, quest for freedom and liberation. Uh, would anyone like to take this question? So I'll go ahead and say something. Uh, and can I just correct you, Michael? I am now a full professor. You know, I was going on the, what I saw it on the happened. website, but. It happened through the pandemic, so it was rather anticlimactic. Well, in congratulations the, in to the you. Of things. My, my apologies. <laughs> no, not, not at all. Just kidding. And you know, uh, when I said that, I, I, something told me, you know, that's probably not <laughs> And all of right. course, I called you out on it, right? Because uh, right. there are not that many of, of us who look like me in that rank, so I have to make the claim. But anyway, um, to be serious, I, I would argue that there is, and, and you know, I, I, I thought about this question in terms of how I would think about, you know, how we think about canons, right? So if we're thinking about it in terms of when we started using the term African diaspora, um, if there's a canon since then, and I guess maybe then we could date it to, you know, the work of Joseph Harris and that generation of scholars, right, writing on the African diaspora in the 1960s. Uh, or if we want to, to think of broaden it, to think about people who uh, predated that time from dating back to the 19th century as people who we would describe, right, uh, as uh, uh, writing on concepts of the, of the African diaspora, then we can go to a canon uh, dating to an, to an earlier period. I think that's how I thought about this idea of, of, a, of a canon. I mean, and of course, it raises the question of how do we even think about how we define a canon, right? Uh, um, so uh, I think I'll answer that way. I have, I have a similar, similar thoughts on that. On one end, we think about the history of the history of the African diaspora. And then we also think about um, if we're doing a graduate course or a graduate exam, what books would they have to read? Right. And what makes it difficult, I think, is that just the African, as you say, in the end, Dr. Blyden is defining the diaspora, defining it as a field or a subfield. And then also think about just even as historians, 
we are engaging through the history of the Af or African diasporic history with anthropologists and with lit crit folks. Yeah. They think about Brent uh, Edwards, who's critical in this, in this makes a critical intervention. I would consider him a historian, but he's not in the field of, field of history. Um, but yeah, so we, we think about um, Herskovitz certainly is within this debate and his, his engagement with E. Franklin Frazier and uh, Minson Price, of course, Sterling Stuckey is very important, not only to the discipline and defining it, but also to institution building within it. And I would certainly include uh, our very own Dr. Gomez in that kind of a transition moment when we begin not to just look at Africa broadly and a diaspora, but look at the specificities of ethnicity and location and change over time are very important. Uh, but then we could get into a whole political conversation around diaspora that moves beyond culture and think about, okay, do we center Du Bois with that? Uh, the African roots of the war, and think about the Pan-African Congresses and move on and think about Walter Rodney, you know, or do we think about the people who are writing about Walter Rodney? So I, I, I think, yes, there is a canon, but like the diaspora itself, it's, it's, it's still evolving. And I think even perhaps if we have another one, we could sit down and let's start naming people that we assign for our for our classes. I think if me and Professor Bidassi compare, compared our syllabi for our African diaspora courses, and then we showed both of our syllabi to Dr. Blyden, they'd be very different, I think, right? Even though we're all historians of Africa and the African diaspora. Yeah, I would add, um, I agree, and I would add, I think of that generation that you mentioned from the 50s and 60s, George Jefferson, St. Mm -hmm. um, Joseph Harris, moving into you know 70s and 80s as well, as the first attempt to um, really examine diaspora as a concept and sort of begin the process of, a, of an intellectual history of diaspora or the African diaspora, um, and including in that an analysis of um, this, association with the Jewish diaspora. Um, and in that context, we have to think about what makes a diaspora, like as we evolve and the term evolves, like how do we define it? Um, and I think what's interesting, we get into later periods and we think of the nineties and we think of, um, as you said, Ben, outside of history, we think of Brent Hayes Edwards grappling with an intellectual history of it as well, but in a way that was tailored you know, precisely to the argument he was trying to make, right, about translation and all of this. So it leaves some things out as good as his work is. Um, and then we get to, he's also responding to how um, Gilroy, for example, how people started to conflate diaspora with Black Atlantic. Um, so I think there's a canon, obviously, that starts before this moment in the 50s and 60s. And that you know, really is the labor of the black intellectual tradition. Of course, Jefferson and others are white in the 60s moment, right? Um, but I think we have to start there, move forward, and then talk about certain turning points um, in the scholarly literature that um, led us away from a more capacious understanding that the people in the 50s and the 60s actually had, right? Because when we get to the question later about new directions, I think we will see that a lot of them are not actually new, but we kind of forgot in the 90s, I would say, right? Um, so yes, I think there are many canons, but we've been tracing different genealogies um, that have different origins in different places with different languages and different um, points of view. And it's really complicated. Doesn't, don't you think though, it's or part of what complicates it and makes it exciting at the same time is that so much of the work has been in edited volumes. So there's, there's this conversation going on constantly, That's true. right? There's no one just saying this is the definitive history. I know uh, Patrick Manning wrote the book, um, A Cultural History, where he tried to like set out to say, okay, this is what it is. Mm -hmm. But it's like, you're saying like, uh, Brent Edwards is in conversation with uh, um, uh, uh, Robin Kelly and Tiffany Patterson, yeah. and, and they're talking back to Paul Gilroy, but they're also talking to these us who are more African-centered historians and say that uh, uh, there are other forms of engagement, right? But when I do it, I, I always start with, um, I, I think he doesn't get enough attention, but Elliot Skinner's essay, yep. the um, Joseph Harris book, yep. um, the title is, 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 is failing me right now. Oh, dialectic, right dialectic contradictions. Dialect, I was gonna say dialectics and yeah. 
Dialectic um, contradictions in Africa. Dialectic between diasporas and homelands. Yes. Right. Because right. even if we, if we, even if we say, okay, it's a little dated, and we we have moved on from that strict definition of diaspora tied to the Jewish experience, right. it's a starting point to me. Right. And I would say this is a must read for for as we begin to talk about what is diaspora and, and the canon of diaspora history. And let's not forget Colin Palmer's essay. Right. Right. That's a you know that's mm -hmm. an essay that one can't ignore as part of a, a, a of a conversation about a, a, di a diaspora canon. And I think what you said, Ben, about a must read is really important because I find that more recent or younger scholars do not even like the concept of a canon. Right? Right. I talked about a canon at a dinner recently and they called me an old school historian. <laughs> and I'm thinking, right, so we don't read, um, you know, the so-called old people and we think it's, you know, outdated. And I think we have to read those people, of course, quarrel with them, right, critique them, but we have to read them. Read them. Um, so I think a part of the problem why we've not been able to have um, greater consistency beyond the whole thing of the edited volumes. So I think people are not reading where we're coming from. Um, right? we, lose we lose something with that. Hmm? We lose something if we, we don't have foundational not. text. Absolutely. If you disagree with them. Yeah. Exactly. And like, I don't understand why we can't read them, disagree with them, and then add to it. Mm -hmm. um, but I think people think it's a radical act to actually reject what came before us. Mm -hmm. um, that's absurd. Yeah. <laughs> that seems to be counter, it seems to, you know, kind of be antithetical to the whole notion of scholarship. <laughs> you know, sometimes I, I read, certain, you know, you know, some of the, some of the newer work is fantastic yeah, yeah, yeah. and is innovative, but some of it I'm reading it and I'm saying, well, <laughs> this is not a new idea, no, no. you no. know, and in fact, um, you know, you wonder whether, you know, references to relevant work is, is, you know, an oversight or, you know, consciously uh, performed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I, I'm, I want to kind of come back to this whole business that uh, Professor Badesi mentioned about genealogies and different genealogies, yeah? And that's really interesting to me because where do we place, you know, negritude and negrismo and all of the discussion that, that came out of the Caribbean with respect to, you know, linguistic studies and anthropological studies and so forth. I mean, this whole question of uh, creolite and, 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 the, the, you know, the whole issue of how, what is the relationship between Africa and the Americas, you know, was kind of, um, kind of not, it was kind of thoroughly examined, not only by way of scholars, but also writers in the Caribbean. And, 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 and oftentimes that conversation is not taken up in North America. I mean, it just doesn't move. And, and so, you know, we're not necessarily reinventing the wheel, but we're coming at, <clears throat> at these conversations, you know, in the absence of having really, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, proper foundation and preparation. So, I mean, things like this, I mean, you know, is it negritude as a, a negritude continues on, you know, in, the, in publications of uh, Présence Africaine and so forth. I mean, it's, it, it, it continues to this day. What is this relationship to what we're calling the African diaspora? Right. You seem to be cognate, cognate, you know, intellectual movements. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what Brent, Brent Edwards was talking about to say that uh, not all of these engagements are emanating from Africa. So we have to account for those. But going back to must reads, that's why looking at the movements in Brazil, it, it speaks to the, that time the time in which these works are emerging. Reading Negritude, they're engaged in a particular debate in that particular moment and making particular claims. So it's, it's a window into that moment. That's why Kim Butler's book, Today is Not a Day to Remember Titles for Me, obviously. Freedom's Given. Freedom's Given, Freedom's Won. There you go, all right. Uh, but she, she brings that to the, I think there's a, there's a, there's a language, there's a, there's, a, there's a language problem as well coming from North America. But Kim yeah. Butler's work, she shows that not only do we have these pockets in Brazil that are different but similar to movements in the United States, but also in Brazil itself. So Sao Paulo is different from Salvador in the same moment because of demographics. So she really brings to life 
and that history and the importance of understanding that time through their own literature, through their own newspapers? Well, you know, we understand historically why a lot of this uh, scholarship and a lot of this work uh, emanates from, you know, the so-called um, uh, African diaspora. But what about the continent itself? I mean, are there works that are being generated from the continent that also that that speak to the the question of global Africa? Yeah, and need to be you know you know re, you know qualify as a kind of as kind of canonic interventions. Well, I mean, absolutely. I think the work by early African scholars, right? Uh, um, again, this this idea that you know the, the point that Monique raises about us ignoring certain you know certain literature. I mean, the, some of the work that came out from early you know African scholars, you know, DK and people like that, I think, are important uh, uh, um, parts of the canon that we can't that we can't ignore uh, um, if we think if if we're thinking about understanding the African diaspora. Yes, maybe they may have been focused on the continent, those histories of, uh, you know, of the continent, scholars from Africa writing about the slave trade, but, you know, absolutely. Uh, and, and I suppose that's, that's been a big part of the field, right, is this, this tendency to ignore scholars coming out of Africa. And those, those imbalances and inequities, of course, that you know, we here in the academies uh, um, outside of the continent are privileged in ways uh, um, that our work gets you know, recognized, our work gets, is out there. But there are scholars in Africa whose work. You know, uh, um, and even more contemporarily, I'm, I've, uh, you know, what I'm interested in is you know, a lot of the work that is uh, not a lot, but a, a significant portion of the work, and I maybe I just said the same thing, of scholars who are either based in the continent or are you know African born, and who are concerned with quote unquote the African diaspora or global Africa, yeah. you know have an emphasis on you know um, <clears throat> more subsequent um, dispersals, if you will, of movements of, of African people into various parts of the world, mm -hmm. and and I think that. Obviously, what we want to do or we, what we want to examine, right, is how these how these different genealogies to to, you know, borrow from Professor Berdasi's terminology, co cohere, how they come together, how they how they inter intersect and, and perhaps, you know, how they converge and diverge. Mm -hmm. I think that that is something that, you know, we want to see more of as we go down the as we continue down the pike. But you might argue though, that some of the earliest works on diaspora were coming out of Continent. West Africa, but they were dealing with a specific diaspora, really it's the Sierra Leonean diaspora, Jai Ayandele. Those are to understand West African history, to understand the way that <laughs> the significance dispersal, this idea of return that was very prominent in the 1970s and 80s, that's coming out of, out of Sierra Leone. I, I would suggest, um, was it the 60s and 70s? Um, the, the work of Akintala Wise, the late Akintala Wise, a historian out of Sierra Leone on the Creoles, that's seminal. I think, I, mean, I think everybody should read Dr. Wise's book on the Sierra Leone Creole. Uh, and are we, and are, we are we including this work in our, in our syllabi on diaspora? <laughs> we should. We should be, you know. I have my students read Wise. It's, you know, it's hard to access as a book, but, but, it, but his work is seminal to understanding, you know, the history of Sierra Leone. Uh, um, same for you know Arthur Porter, Doctor Doctor Arthur Porter's work on Creoldom. That's central to understanding the African diaspora. Early scholars writing about Liberia, right? So uh, you know, so I think the ways in which uh, I, I, the way in which we've been defining diaspora and how it changes. You know, I think I've said this perhaps in, in this you know chatting with all of you before. But you know, when I was in graduate school, we didn't when we talked about the African diaspora, we didn't talk about the United States. It was like African American and African diaspora, right? As if the United States or the experience of African Americans was not part of the African diaspora, right? Uh, I'm older than Monique and Ben. Perhaps they don't remember this time. Uh, but Michael, you surely remember a time when African diaspora did not. It was separated from from African American studies or African American history, right? Yes, the world, of the, the world of the Africans versus the world of the Negro. Right, and yeah. so, 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 so the idea that in that, you know, I mentioned Colin Palmer's article before, where you know, for a long time when we talked about diaspora, Africa, the continent itself was almost not part of the conversation. 
So, mm -hmm. so I think. Well, this just just what the politics of the of the of you know the politics involved embedded in in in, in what we do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can I, can, I go, go ahead. can I go back? Can I go back just to to Dr. Blyden's earlier point and just this, 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 the significance of Sierra Leone, which is reminding me that there was a time in the '90s when there was more conversation around that yep. initial diaspora. Mm -hmm. And I would say, going back to our initial question about foundational text, what I do is at, to to help my students understand the 20th century. They read Blyden, mm -hmm. not Doctor. They, they could read you, Dr. Blyden, but. <laughs> Not me, not my Blyden. <laughs> but they, they read Blyden. <laughs> right, they, they read Blyden. They also, to compare him, we also could read some Crummel and Africanus Horton, another Sierra Leonean, yeah. who is really looking at a West African diaspora. Mm -hmm. This is an internal African diaspora. He's speaking to West African yeah. elites, most of whom are Nigerian Gold Coasters or, or yeah. Sierra Leoneans. Mm -hmm. But I think that's foundational for understanding ideologically, because we're really having two conversations, one's anthropological and one's the political, I yeah. think. Yeah. And the, the two come together at spots. But I think that late 19th century is, is critical for understanding, how do you understand Garvey without getting into Blyden and Crummel and yep, Africanus Horton? I don't think you can. Yeah. Well, you know, there will be those who disagree with you. So uh, you that's know, fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I mean, that, I mean, that opens into, you know, that opens into a whole nother yeah. debate about uh, <clears throat> what the nature of the relationship between African descended people and, mm -hmm. and the African continent. Although I agree with you, Ben, I don't disagree mm -hmm. with you, but I'm mm -hmm. just saying that this, you know, brings us to another uh, uh, register, if you will, in terms of how we understand this, these, these questions. So what is the relationship in your minds between what we're calling the African diaspora and Black internationalism? <laughs> hmm. <laughs> between, I'm going to let Dr. Talton and Dr. Badassi take this up since they've been part of this conversation. We've been in that. We've been more in recently. That. <laughs> and I'll jump in if necessary. Go ahead, Monique. I'm follow you. Oh God. Okay. Um. So. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah. I mean, first of all, I'll just say I I think people should define the terms when they use them. Mm -hmm. Um should be committed or more committed to defining them. Um, and then it's interesting because um, I think of black internationalism as more of a project, whether it's political or you know, cultural, um, it's a project. And then African diaspora for me has to constitute place. I mean, geography is a root. Um, so I know some people use African diaspora and black diaspora um interchangeably which mm -hmm, for me mm -hmm. is a problem because a diaspora has to have a root and for many people black doesn't have to be connected to africa um you know so we can go on and on about you know for me african diaspora we're talking about two very different things and african diaspora is a much more expansive term than black internationalism which mm -hmm. i associate with specific historical moments yeah which i tie to uh, which has a kind of marxist slant that doesn't have to, you know, appear in histories of Pan-Africanism or is a part, obviously, of the history of the African diaspora, but mm -hmm. it holds a lot more. Um, so it, I think I would start there and say that African diaspora has to constitute place or places. Um, and we're, you know, we have to be clear about which populations we're talking about and there are people of African descent where Black internationalism as a project can engage the ways that um, people of African descent have interacted with non, with people who are not of African descent um, for a particular goal, right? Um, and I'm saying that knowing fully well that um, that generation of the 50s and 60s, I think St. Clair Drake in particular grappled with um, spaces in the Caribbean or the Americas more broadly where people interacted with Indians and other groups. And I think he was probably pulling from Rodney who had famously included Indians in his definition of black, right? Mm -hmm. And Drake talked about that within the context of sorting through, you know, the African diaspora. Um, but I would say though, generally 
um, that black internationalism is where that belongs and then African diaspora is, you know, a wider mm -hmm. um, concept that has to be about who we're talking about and where they are. You see that? Aren't you glad I pushed you to go first? Because that was, that was brilliant. That was better than I would have done. Not true, Benjamin, but thank you. <laughs> but also, also the, like you said, the solidarities, right? The yeah. solidarities that aren't necessarily emanating from, from Africa. I think one of the challenges is that Black internationalism has become a catch-all for Black engagement around the world. They're calling all forms of, not everyone is, but there's a lot of scholarship that just puts Black internationalism in the title. And it's, it's not really a, a forms of political engagement that would fit that definition. Now, we could say the same about diaspora as well. Yeah. You know, but I think the younger scholars and some scholars who I don't put myself in this category, scholars my age and younger are doing a very good job of establishing this canon, particularly out of the African-American Intellectual History Society. They're pushing this idea of what Black internationalism is. And so I, and they have an institution behind that. So I think they've, they've, done, a, they've done a commendable job. Well, let me ask a question before Professor Blyden uh, speaks. What, how would you, um, how would you represent, uh, how would you capture uh, in an article or in a volume, scholarly discourse and disagreement over, you know, what constitutes the African diaspora, what constitutes Black internationalism, you know, clearly there are a series of debates, right? Mm -hmm. All, all about all of that, even even the even the term diaspora, whether it should, should continue, whether it's applicable, you know, whether it's had its day, so forth. I mean, there are debates surrounding all of that. How do you, how do you capture? Okay, let's say in an edited volume, mm -hmm. those debates. Um, yeah. In terms of what constitutes diaspora and what constitutes Black internationalism. Yeah, for, so for example, for example, with respect to the African diaspora, mm -hmm. you know, is the Black Atlantic as a framework a part of that or not? You know, and, 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 you know, and for those who, who adhere to um, a conceptualization of the Black Atlantic, uh, specifically for the purpose of, of omitting or marginalizing Africa. I mean, that's part of the, pro let's say that's part of their project, okay? To the extent that that represents a legitimate framework and perspective, how do you capture that tension? I mean, I think we have to. I think we start with telling the truth. I mean, have to. I think we would have to probably have a number of um, essays that that approach it, like, like an intellectual history of the term. Maybe one, but it would be difficult, but really interesting work. Um, I think you tell the truth. I think, I mean, I think the work, not necessarily the, well, the concept as well, but the work that was done for Black Atlantic, um, the book, is obviously, you know, relevant to the African diaspora and the history of the African diaspora, right? But we have to tell the truth that that redirected the scholarship um, in problematic ways and we're still working our way out of that, right? Having said that, I think we have to, the reason we'll probably need to trace this um, and write this essay or a few essays um, is scholars of the 50s and 60s, you know, Joseph Harris was talking about Indian Ocean diasporas. Right. Right? Right. Um, St. Clair Drake was talking about Mexico and Spanish speaking countries in the Americas and grappling with the Caribbean and, and also was placing the African diaspora or um, movement um, within the context of movement within the continent. So he was looking at the formation of um, the diaspora in the Americas through transatlantic slavery um, within the context of the formation of diasporas within Africa, right? And then of course, we can go back to Ivan Van Sertima and trace it all the way from there forward. And in that sense, when we talk about a, a new direction in terms of the more recent migrations that have nothing to do with transatlantic slavery, 
um, all of these Nigerian fiction writers like Chimamanda and all these people are capturing that so well, um, that it is a part of a longer conversation, but we were seriously redirected because of the impact of certain, of certain books, right? Um, and so I think, I, I think we tell the truth that we highlight the texts that have um, been pivotal um, and that we all about, you know, is it the same outside of the context of the US Academy? We may have been redirected, but we're, but we're other people redirected. Right, right, right. Like, right. In other places. Right, right. Um, You know, so we have mm -hmm. all of those questions. And then of course, language is an issue. You know, people are doing Francophone may not have cared that much about, um, about, you know, this particular focus on Black Atlantic. But, you know, but I think we also have to, you know, call up the extent to which the use of some of these terms, you know, has just been strange, you know, that, I don't know, like, they become kind of sexy and then people don't know what they mean, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? So it's like we have departments that are, you know, African-American and African diaspora studies, like African-American is not a part of the diaspora. Um, and I think that we, one of the things that we really, we really loved, I think people loved is the fact that we could, we, they were allowed to disconnect Africa from, from the African diaspora, mm -hmm. from black, black internationalism for sure. Mm -hmm. And that of course goes back to colonial tropes and we have to tell the truth about that as well, even yeah. if people didn't do it yeah. consciously. Um, I feel like I'm talking too much, but anyway, that's where I'd begin <laughs> with the essay. No, but, but you're right and I agree. I mean, when I think of black internationalism, I think of it as, you know, more, sort of more of an activity as opposed to thinking of a African diaspora as a field of study. Actually, I might have to get my halo back, Michael, and put my lights on in a little okay, bit. Okay, yeah, yeah. Dark out. It's it getting it dark out here. I will when I yeah. finish, right? So Black, okay. Inter uh, Black International, right? These efforts to sort of forge transnational collaboration, solidarities with other people of color, right? Whereas African diaspora, uh, um, I was reading, rereading St. Clair Drake talking about African diaspora and pan Africanism a little bit, right? Centers in the in the in the world of Africa, right? In the world of people of African descent, mm -hmm. right? And I think that's where, in my mind, I make a distinction between Black internationalism and African diaspora, mm -hmm. right? Black internationalist activity, just that we could talk about maybe pan Africanist activity, right? But African diaspora, I think of much more as a field of study. Mm -hmm. on that, right? Yeah, I'd agree with that. Right. Now, mm -hmm. And I think, right, turn around. Are you, I'm sorry, are you done? The yeah, 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 yeah. I was going to add that you know, some of the people who were working in the 60s and 70s were Africanists. We're trying to define the term. I mean, even George right. Shepherdson, right. a white British person, right. he was actually making these connections through African history. That's right. That's yeah. right. Right. And so it seems like we're going back, it's crazy, we're going back to it as Africanists in this uh -huh. period, but we're not, it's not new either. No, no. But I think in your telling that, I like that, I like the, the uh, Professor Padesi, I like your insistence upon telling the truth, because I think that we need to also, you know, in, 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 in the, uh, <clears throat> in such an essay or two, which attempts to kind of <clears throat> at least acknowledge these different genealogies and these differences of approach and so forth embedded in which are embedded, you know, some fairly significant political differences. Mm -hmm. um, that we also acknowledge, you know, kind of regionality, regional positionality, mm -hmm. you know, I think that's really, really it's important. Crucial. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. You know, I'm just thinking now about, you know, uh, University of West Indies, you know, was at the forefront of uh, publishing uh, material on African studies. You know, that journal is no longer in operation, but some of the most important work on Africa was coming out of the Caribbean. That has just, just been lost, uh, mm -hmm. you know, in this broader conversation. Mm -hmm. Let me just say this. I don't really, in my own mind, and I, you know, I, you know, I'm not always lucid. But in my own mind, I don't necessarily uh, disengage African diaspora from uh, Black internationalism. And I think that Black internationalism can become more capacious. It depends upon, it depends upon how, we, you know, how we define it. 
I do recognize that people who are involved in Black internationalism, both as a both as a political project and as an intellectual project, may or may not have you know uh, much to say about Africa. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but um, but I but I think that you know you know my move is to invest Black internationalism, you know, with a you know uh, Afri- African centered kind of approach. But this something that we subsumed under the category of African diaspora. So I mean, I don't. I mean, I, I, they're not one and the same thing. But black internationalist scholarship activity certainly is part of a larger story that we tell about African diaspora, right? So it's not. But it African could be. Diaspora. But it could be. But the, but you know, you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Because a number of scholars do not. They yeah. want to engage with Africa. That's true. That's but it's true. tricky if we start to, conf- we don't want to conflate the two. No. I could mm-hmm. conflate the two because for him, African diaspora is always a project. Right? Yeah. <laughs> a project. But let's, if we think about text, if we, well, one thing that, one thing that Dennis Lawman said in our, in our Afri- American historical review conversation is, is he, he pointed out that very few scholars of Africa employ the term black internationalism. That's true. That is really coming out of, um, scholars looking at uh, West Indian activists and African American activists, mm-hmm. particularly around like, Claudia Jones, for example, who's starting in Trinidad, I believe, right, and ending up in Harlem and then going to to London. So she's very much a, a Black internationalist uh, and around solidarity around women's rights, labor issues, poverty, and race. Mm-hmm. That makes her a, a Black internationalist. Whereas, uh, you know, in um, Ron Walter's book. Um, Pan-Africanism in the African diaspora. I think something, another book that's often overlooked. We're looking at his, his uh, radical returnees in Ghana. They're acting as people positioning themselves as Pan-Africanists within the African diaspora, engaging with other Africans. Mm-hmm. So I think there's a distinction there. Or even like Monique's work with trotting diaspora is this term that you use. Rastas from Jamaica going to London and to Ethiopia and to Tanzania, engaging in the world as Africans or people of African descent, engaging other Africans. Not always in agreement, but still engaging them. So that's more diaspora, that's Pan-Africanism, as opposed to Black internationalism. Which might be an engagement with China or Japan, right? Or, or uh, India. Right. Look at that, look, look at Mike's face. He's, Mike's not, not, Mike's not other, buying it. Well, you know, other world, 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 world of color. But I, 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 I understand what you're saying. Yeah. I understand what you're saying. But, but I think because the focus has been in a lot of the Black internationalist work, and I'm looking at some titles here, right, is that it, it seems to be, you know, African-American engagement with China, African-American engagement with Japan, or, you know, Caribbean, right? And because Africa has been left out. But what about Bandung? Is that not a kind of Black internationalism where Africans are central? Yeah, I think that's that's fair. Um, well, let me ask you this question. <clears throat> let me ask the panel the panelists this question. Oh Lord, <laughs> what's the relationship? How do you see the relationship between? So we've talked about the African diaspora and its relationship or lack thereof with Black internationalism. Mm-hmm. What about the relationship of the concept of the African diaspora with Pan-Africanism? <laughs> so I can answer that and I'm gonna quote St. Clair Drake because I just read that article okay. where he says, for diaspora to be Pan-Africanist, it must contribute towards maintaining and reinforcing black consciousness and must be reoriented toward the goal of fostering understanding, solidarity and cooperation throughout the black world. Right, so so even he was saying, you know, not everybody who's diaspora is Pan-African, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, so sure. now we tend to, it's very fluid, right? But he's saying there, right? The concept of the black world is necessary for Pan-Africanism. And that's not necessary for black internationalism. And maybe it's not necessary for African diaspora either, but again, you know. Yeah, so Pan-Africanism like black internationalism is a political project. The African diaspora need not necessarily be political. I think of uh, no. the book we gave an award to uh, at Aswad, Oscar De La Torre's book, People of the Rivers, an amazing study of people of African descent in the Amazon and Brazil, engaging with the environment, engaging with nature, engaging with uh, indigenous peoples there. Uh, very, very diasporic, but it's not really a political project. No. And it's not Pan-Africanist either, necessarily. Not Pan-Africanist. No. Yeah, and then we have like, I mean, we always have to make the distinction to like, are we talking about 
or historical actors who had collapsing sensibilities or those who named it their That's activism right. as such. That's right. Versus um, the scholarship and not just scholarship consciously engaged with defining the terms, but also mm -hmm. um, people who are now working or consider themselves as working to, to kind of fill in what gaps we may have about different parts of the African diaspora, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, so those, we have to make sure we're, we're thinking about which one of those, you know, what, what are we talking about, mm -hmm. right? So okay. when you ask, when you say what's the relationship between Pan-Africanism and African diaspora, what are you getting at? Because I feel like, um, <laughs> <laughs> why are you laughing? I feel like um, if it's, yeah, I want to know what you're getting at because in some ways too, I think um, it's not limited to resistance, right? But even though we have to continue to grapple with mm -hmm. conditions, new conditions of inequality mm -hmm. from one historical mm -hmm. period to the next, um, that is not always about um, mm -hmm. resistance. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Well, how would you respond uh, in, 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 to answer your query? How would you respond to- Why not say my the, query with a query? <laughs> Yeah, I'm begging the question. Yeah, that's moderator. true. Moderator. But well, well, yeah, so as moderator, you, thank you. Thank you. I, I claim my prerogative as moderator. As moderator, I'm going to come to the question. Point. Question. Right, what, so how would you, what do you think, how would you respond to the observation that, that in some ways, the African diaspora as an intellectual cultural project is um, uh, emerges out of um, out of um, a kind of exhausted Pan-Africanist movement. That is to say that Pan-Africanism, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. you know, was very kinetic, right? And um, was very, uh, I mean, it was about, you know, uh, uh, real politic, geopolitics, and so forth, and mm -hmm. and uh, but but with the with the fall of apartheid, um, you know, one looks around to see well, where are the Pan African? Right. Where is Pan Africanism? You know, and where are the projects? I mean, we can argue that the UA is Pan African, but beyond that. You know, where are the projects that specifically link what's happening in the Americas and in Europe and in the Middle East and in Asia with the continent? Right. Yeah. You're talking about Pan Africanism with a with a with a capital P. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Right. 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 Yeah, no, I agree. I I I I feel you, Mike, because I think you're saying the fall of apartheid, but even the 60s, when really it begins to gain currency, we look around. Mm -hmm. We think formal imperialism is dying, at least outside of the Portuguese colonies in Southern Africa, and the Caribbean is, is independent. Okay, so now how are we going to engage the Black world? Right. And so the diaspora helps us fill that void yeah. as we see the Monrovia School of Pan-Africanism, capital P Pan-Africanism, dominates, which is really about nation states, yeah. as opposed to Nkrumah's vision of Pan-Africanism. So once Monrovia School dominates, this is my thinking of it, once Monrovia right. School begins to dominate, we have to have a new way of engaging the black world because it's not it can't just be around sovereignty because no. we've achieved that already it has to be more well, so i mean i really like that professor talton so so how do you see i mean can african can the concept of the african diaspora and the pursuit of the african diaspora can it serve as a site from which we can really interrogate and move beyond you know this kind of westphalian notion of independence and freedom, you know, everything devolves to the nation state, mm. which, you know, as we look around in too many instances, it's just, uh, uh, impotent. Mm. Mm -hmm. It you know, can, and it does, but with limits, I think. Okay. Uh, is what I would say. Go ahead. With limits, yeah, yeah. But I mean, I, but you see, this this kind of connects with and articulates with something we left off um, in, in the last webinar. Uh, we were talking about the notion of freedom. And, you know, one of the things, so beyond the notion of, so we have other questions to get to, but, but, but 
but but <laughs> humor me for a second. Uh, if you if you you know beyond the notion of freedom as a, you know a philosophical proposition and as an abstraction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Once we move past that, and we can have all kinds of debates about that, and I'm not a philosopher, so I'm not, you know, well prepared for that anyway. But when we get to the question of the ways in which the Black slash diasporic slash African imagination has been impacted, informed, constrained by, you know, the contingent nature of our experiences, which by and large have, has, have been impositional, and we have moved from one state of, you know, um, of uh, of uh, violence, you know, and uh, tragedy uh, and poverty to another, mm -hmm. collectively speaking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, I wonder: Do we have sufficient space, let alone, you know, <laughs> the opportunity? to think of uh, and imagine, you know, a very different, you know, sets of relationships, political, economic, and so forth. Yeah, that is to say, you understand what I'm asking you, that is to say that our notion of liberation and freedom tends to be predicated on what we see taking place in particular in the West. And if that's, you know, that those are the, that's the definition of what freedom is. That's the definition of independence, mm -hmm. definition of independence and so forth. Mm -hmm. And we're really not, you know, um, I mean, that's one of the things I want to talk about at some point with respect to Walter Rodney's work. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be quiet, but I mean, he talked about, you know, the intervention of the colonial project at a moment when things were in process of evolving in the right. African continent. Right. And that and that those processes were arrested. Yeah. And we've never really been able to get back to, you know, rethinking our circumstances, rethinking our realities. Right. Right. Yeah, I think I think you, you're asking two different questions. Um, or maybe three. Yeah, or four, actually. But the first the, the first one going back. Yeah. Um, I think so I would differentiate between the scholarship. Um, that moved beyond, uh, you know, Pan-Africanism and, and the different ways that Black people imagined freedom after independence, and that it's a right about nationalism, etc. And I think Africanists, um, historiographically, that's the turn that we've made. Yeah. The work on the 20th century and work on nationalism and independence, that the only place left for them to go um, which is where we are now, is to talk about, to kind of rewind a bit. So instead of, um, you know, the kind of 70s, 60s, 70s, new um, history departments in African universities talking about this very unifying narrative um, of independence and how we got there, um, and then the decline and everybody, oh God, we're poor, political independence was not enough, it's about economic freedom. Mm -hmm. Um, I think no, historians are going back to say, um, but at the same time that there was all of this nation building and Africanism was quite a force. And I think I would argue that it never disappeared. I mean, black people globally were aware of the ways that we continue to struggle, right? Um, so I think we are finding those histories. Um, and so that forces even scholars of the continent who are trained in diaspora to engage diaspora because our historical actors were, right? Um, in the 60s, 70s. So I think I have to make a distinction between the people on the ground, what they were doing and the fact that scholars were ignoring. Um, and, and I think it was kind of the political moment where people thought black nationalism, pan-Africanism, third world activism, lost, Right, and, and a, it, it's sort of a new day where capitalism triumphed and, you know, Thatcher Reagan type of period was ushered in. Um, so I think are um, reconstructing those history. And then onto your second point about what can we, or should we enlist those in terms of um, a project to think about what we might do um, to regain what Rodney said we, <laughs> we lost, right? Like how we can um, actually go back to 
you know, the scholars of the Black intellectual tradition for whom this work was a part of our project of liberation. I, I feel like that's their call. Is that the call? Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, you put your finger on it. Mm -hmm. It's not a it's not an intellectual conversation if we don't quote Fanon, I think, right? <laughs> because it's Fanon, Fanon as well looked at this, this moment of possibilities where we didn't have to buy into the Westphalian, Westphalian notion. In fact, if we do, it'll be detrimental. And I think he was, he was correct. Although I think the possibilities weren't as fruitful as they seemed in the 1950s and 60s. I think the constraints were far, far greater than, mm. they, than they anticipated. But just looking at, uh, we, we must find alternatives to the nation state. And that's the Pan-African, Pan-Africanist, the Pan-African political project. But I think, Mike, I, uh, Monique is diving into it. What is the political project behind African diaspora, right? What are the possibilities there? Um, and I think that's worth exploring. And we're seeing that more recently with the African diaspora forum. Um, it becomes a little more abstract. We have these museums that are popping up that have African diaspora in them, ones in San Francisco that has a really interesting take on diaspora. And here in Brooklyn, we have the Museum of Contemporary African Diaspora. Um, so, and then we have the Year of Return, which taps into right. a, two different diasporas, overlapping diasporas to get into Earl Lewis. Um, but I don't really have a sufficient answer to it, but I think it's worth, worth interrogating the political possibilities of a diaspora. Well, you know, I'm, uh, not to interrupt you, Ben, but I, you know, there in, in uh, Professor Blyden's city, the museum uh, there for, what is it called? It was Museum of African-American, whatever. History and, History and culture. History and culture, yeah. I, so I, I visited, you know, at an earlier, moment, you know, when it was kind of first opened and so forth. And, you know, it is extraordinary in many, many ways. But one thing that at least it didn't do a couple of years ago very well was it did not connect to the diaspora. Mm -mm. It was an, it is an, Amer it was an American project at that moment. And they were, I think they're aware of that. And I think their moves towards good moving beyond that. I don't know where they are and if it will happen because yeah. you know not everybody is on the diaspora bandwagon as we well know well it's that was that was just yeah you know, yeah because you know even with respect to professor badesi mentioned that people would prefer you know the department of african american studies or this that or the other you know you do have that kind of pushback against the diaspora you know we need to recognize that, that. absolutely but we still have to look at, and, and it's, it's very corporatist, it's very neoliberal, but the year of return was hugely popular. Huge. There are so many problems with it, but anytime people are looking at Africa, particularly Ghana, in a very positive way as a destination to engage with people from the Caribbean, people from the United States, from Canada, and across the continent, I hear there are a lot of South Africans there as well. We, we, can't, we can't say this is a small thing. Yeah, I, 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 I certainly have my critiques of the white parties and this consumerism in the side, and also these essays that came out after about the level at which you connected with the continent and said nothing about Ghanaians. It was all about my relationship with it. But that, we were used to that, though, right? Yeah. But still, I think there's something potentially generative about that. Yeah. Well, it is, it is certainly the notion of the African diaspora has certainly impacted. The lexicon, at least insofar as the U.S. is concerned, and elsewhere. I mean, people are talking constantly about. I mean, this is now, you know, uh, common fare. You know, people talk about the African diaspora, and so Thank it'll be you. interesting to see where we take it. Uh, professors, we 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 have reached that moment in which we'd like to oh, really? allow for um, those who are in attendance to participate. So, if you would like to. If you would like to, you know, ask a question or make a statement or so forth, um, I, I don't have any issue with you actually verbalizing that, but you also can put it in the chat. So, um, uh, so uh, we have something here from Linda Day. Uh, Linda Day, would you like to verbalize your observations, or do you or do you just want them to remain in the chat? 
think we can allow her to speak. Yeah, yeah I, uh, Ms. Taylor I can, can allow her to speak. I think I can too. Yes, I allow her. Okay, yeah. so Linda Day, would you like to speak? No? Okay. All right. Uh, Chad is okay. All right. <laughs> All right. So uh, she writes at the dominance of international Black uh, popular culture uh, with Bob Marley and, and Montana, Montana and so forth. Um, and the, and, um, the NMAAH, AAHC certainly depicted the slave trade as a global project. I like how they connected the Caribbean in that section. Okay, very good. All right, thank you, uh, Linda Day. Anyone else, would anyone else like to, to engage our panelists? If not, we'll just keep talking. But there's something to that as well, what Dr. Day is saying. It, that depiction, there's two things I, 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 I was struck by. One is that, as Dr. Day is saying, they did have the global dimensions of the yeah. Atlantic trade. And that was quite nice. But this, but then that's the end of it. The engagement doesn't really continue beyond. And that's what our project with the, with the diaspora really is about, that the engagement continues, whether it's in Brazil. And Dr. Gomez, you wrote brilliantly about the Denmark VZ conspiracy with how Haiti looms large and the imagination within the Caribbean and Jamaica and in the Southern US. And then Hayes writing about Africans going across from, from, from Bahia to Lagos and Gold Coast and back. And so the museum makes it seem the break is like this, this old trope of the, uh, the, the middle passage as this rupture right. between peoples. And then also from this rupture, you have this dark period of enslavement, but then there's this ever moving progress toward success, right? And we end, at, we end with Oprah Winfrey at the top. At least it was Oprah Winfrey. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who it is now, but Oprah's, Oprah's at the top for the part of the museum that has the most light, the most air. It's, yeah. you know, it's freer when you're down. At the beginning is dark and cramped. So there's this, this American progress mm -hmm. and the Middle Passage rupture, which I found, I found unsettling. But that, but that last, that top floor also has the work of, um, Who's the artist? Is it Biggers who does yeah. the, you know, where I'm Africa kidding. resonates in his work, mm -hmm. right? So that's there too. Um, so it's, it's yeah, yeah. You if know. you've never seen Biggers work, I mean, the actual work, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know where it is now, but the installations, they're huge installations. Right, you know, so. They're really, really old. So, so, so Africa is present throughout. I mean, we, we, we're maybe sounding a lot more pessimistic about it than, than not. And, you know. I'm being, I'm being overly critical, perhaps. Yeah. And, and I know that the museum is also reaching out to, to, to Black immigrant communities. I know that for a fact. I saw it when it first opened up. I haven't been since they first yeah. opened. So Africa is there in, 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 you know, maybe in not ways that, you know, we might want to see more of it in there, but, but it's there. Well, it's developing. That's, that's yeah. encouraging. Yeah. We don't want to be overly critical. No. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, we oh, well, we just... <laughs> I mean, right. Why not? Yeah. No. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Fantastic. Uh, so, uh, Leslie, has Leslie, has Leslie, Leslie has a comment. Has Leslie, a comment. could you, uh, Ms. Taylor, can you uh, uh, allow her to speak? Professor Alexander. Give me one second. Okay, she's able to talk. Alexander. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, we good. Can it see, is... We can see your face, too. Okay. <laughs> I can't a, version, see. a version of it. A version of it. Yeah, you don't, you actually don't want to see me live right now. Uh, so I just came back from walking the dog. But um, I, you know, I'm really enjoying this conversation, really want to thank you for it. And Nima, want to congratulate you again um, on your promotion. Thank you. I just wanted to add a little um, thing to the conversation. I was really appreciating in particular um, the part of your discussion that was sort of thinking through some of the differences between diaspora, Black internationalism, and Pan-Africanism. I think it's a really important conversation that needs to take place. Mm -hmm. And I think we, a lot of us, <laughs> feel confusion um, and sort of contradiction between um, some of these terms. And it's something I've been working through um, in my own writing recently. But I just wanted to add that one of the things that I thought was really helpful um, was uh, some of the writings that Michael West has mm -hmm. done. Um, 
in an effort to define black internationalism, because I think that's been for people who work on black internationalism, I think that's been one of the problems is that it hasn't had a clear definition and therefore people have used it and interpreted it <laughs> broadly. Yeah. Um, but one of the things I found helpful about Michael West's definition was in terms of kind of putting boundaries around the difference between having a black internationalist consciousness and what is actually black internationalism. Yeah. And in his you know, perspective, there's a really important difference between consciousness and action. Mm -hmm. And so you can have people who are, who are very aware of themselves, right? As people in diaspora, as diasporic people who have a clear um, kind of sentiment, right? Around um, being in a, a black internationalist space. But for him, what really defines black internationalism is struggle. Mm -hmm. right, is activism, like the point at which people become engaged in a broader movement to actually participate in, help support, however you want to think about that, liberation struggles mm -hmm. that are happening in other parts of the world. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I would be interested to hear him or, you know, certainly people on the panel mm -hmm. um, talk about is then how we would think about that differently from Pan-Africanism, right? Um, mm -hmm. You know, if pan, clearly, you know, Pan-Africanism is also about a consciousness, right? But um, it is also about engagement with struggle. And I think it does open up then the possibility that Black internationalism can, as Nima was saying, be about, you know, um, African peoples in China. It can be about, you know what I mean? Like it can be mm -hmm. lots of different things. Whereas perhaps, you know, Pan-Africanism is more specifically about engagement with the continent. Um, I don't know. I, this is something I'm still thinking through. So I'd be really interested in, in, you know, hearing the panel's views about how you might make a distinction between what Michael West is talking about and Pan-Africanism. But I think his distinction around the difference between consciousness and struggle I, was really useful for me. And I think that's the distinction that St. Clair Drake makes between diaspora and Pan-Africanism, uh, because central to Pan-Africanism for Drake right. was that consciousness and, and, you know, activism and struggle, you know, solidarity, uh, right? But, but focused on, on the Black world, as opposed to Black internationalism, right, which assumes solidarity with people of color. And I think that's where I that's where I see the sort of distinction. And I think where, you know, I, I think that's where I see the distinction between Pan-Africanism and Black internationalism is Pan-Africanism's focus on the Black world, solidarity between and among people in the Black world, as opposed to Black internationalism, which could be, you know, solidarities and collaboration between Black people and people of color mm -hmm. worldwide, uh, you know, not necessarily of the black world as we would define it. So not if you if I'm engaging with India, it's not just with CD people, but it's with, you know, with, you know, the Indian nationalist struggle what, or, or, you know, uh, that I think that's where for me, I, 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 I see the distinction, but the, but definitely the activism uh, is the distinction between whether we're talking about black internationalism and diaspora or, or as Drake, uh, argued Pan-Africanism and diaspora. Okay, uh, and we have uh, some comments uh, again from Linda Day, African people in Ukraine. My comment on international black culture was in response to the fact that the political liberation of the continent seems to no longer be a way to connect the African diaspora. It's just an interesting point because it's, it speaks to this new younger generation of Africans and first generation Africans in Europe and the United States and the ways in which popular culture is a way of connecting across national boundaries. You know, African, West African music in particular has become part of American popular music and popular music in London. And I was in Jamaica recently and they were playing nothing but Afrobeats. Yep. <laughs> it was phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So moving beyond the political to popular culture, it seems right. to be a way of connecting. Right. Okay. Well, uh, Go ahead. Dr. Badassi wants to jump in. Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't. I'm sorry. I didn't hear you. Sorry, sorry. I was saying it, it's a kind of. Well, obviously, I argue against 
with popular culture um, in a way, but I, I feel like it's a different type of um, engagement. But I guess my greater question in response to Professor Badesi, could you kind of, um, um, your, your volume needs to come up just a little bit. It's all the way up. Why can't you hear me? Can you hear me now? Okay. Okay. Well, we'll work better. with it. Go ahead. A little bit better. There you go. Okay. So, um, I guess my question in response to Leslie is what do we do with black, let's say political actors who were forging connections, um, like Forbes Burnham or, you know, Kenya after independence, like what do we do with the conservatives mm -hmm. if we limit our definitions to struggle? Their histories are part mm -hmm. of the mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Their histories are part of the very real ways in which black people um, mm. bought into capitalism or um, neoliberal structures or whatever it is, right? Um, how do we, those histories, which are very real histories, like, you know, you know, everybody's grandparents would be like, oh, I marched with Martin Luther King in the 60s and everybody was in their house. Not everybody was, not everybody was an activist, right? Yeah. Um, so that's my only concern mm -hmm. about, um, mm -hmm. All of our histories are not reactionary, are not guided mm -hmm. by, um, mm -hmm. you know, this resistance. So I'm, I'm wondering what we do with those histories. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it wouldn't fall into Black internationalism then, because Black internationalism is challenging racial capitalism, imperialism, colonial, right. and labor discrimination. Right. Where, but on the flip side, I mean, some people who supported Renamo and supported Savimbi would call themselves Pan-Africanists. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if and if, if we're gonna if internationalism is gonna refer to the post nation state moment when you're thinking of international in that sense, mm -hmm. um, and people are doing all sorts of things across borders, just you know, as a matter of fact, mm -hmm. do we include those histories in black internationalism. You know, like sort of interstate, like state to state connections. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, there are more questions and answers, but I think you right. know. Okay, well, those or are. Is far, or is it foreign relations? Or is it, you know, foreign <laughs> policy, right? Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, very good. Yeah. Uh, so we have something from uh, Maura McLean. Uh, Maura, would you like to speak? No. <laughs> no. Okay. I'll read your question. Whether for scholarship or for struggle, do members of the panel see meaningful connections? between evolving conceptions of African diaspora and challenges to ahistorical mainstream conceptions of Africans in, in antiquity, the classics, and Western civilization. Starting trouble here. <laughs> Starting some trouble. I know. <laughs> hmm. Hmm. You know what? I actually, I think, of course, you know, if we're thinking of like reversing sale, Michael's work, um, then I think historians, you know, who do African diaspora think about it as like explaining what happened in an earlier period to set the context. But I do think that we should think about or have an essay about, um, about the more contemporary engagement with um, ancient Egypt and Nubia. And I think a lot of it is problematic. And I think we, dismiss it because Afrocentricity had so many problematic pieces, right? But I do think it's a very, it still it remains a very important part of how people come to consciousness for whatever reason. And quite often young people come to it and then evolve beyond it. But somehow black people love a king and a queen. Like we really, that really resonates. <laughs> that really resonates when we're becoming conscious, we want to be kings and queens. Mm -hmm. And obviously that's not where our liberation is, mm -hmm. uh, but I think we have to tell the truth again and understand that many, many people come to consciousness through this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's a long tradition of this going back to the, you know, to the 19th century, right? <laughs> people did go, you know, hark back to those kings and queens. So it's, there's a long tradition. It's not a, con not just a new contemporary. 19th era. century makes sense because kings and queens still has <laughs> <laughs> some sway. Um, but I like this idea. So when, when I learned it at Howard, we did, we did antiquity first, we did Nubia, Miroe, 
we did Kemet, Egypt. And it was a way of saying, okay, when we get into this diaspora piece, it's gonna be a lot about enslavement and a lot about race, but we're showing you that that's not, that's not the, the only part of this history of black people. So we have to begin there, that's foundational. And then we get into the ideas of where race, the idea of Western notions of race and debating whether it comes from the Arabs or, or Iberia. And then we get swept into this uh, long period of slavery and remembering that uh, this period of enslavement lasts longer than this period that we're in right now of, of freedom. But I like this idea of looking at antiquities looking at Miroy, looking at Nubia, looking at kings and queens, Haile Selassie even in the, the line, from the diasporic standpoint. And how have we, how has the diaspora engaged that history, whether it's through Basil Davidson and uh, Ali Mazrui, whether it's through Roots, whether it's through Rastafari, uh, whether it's through art, mm -hmm. that, 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 that history has mattered. Kings and queens have have mattered. Even my neighbor who greets my wife as Empress, you know. <laughs> wow. When I when I was writing my book, one of my readers said, "Well, why is she talking about ancient Mali and, and Ghana? Most of the people who ended up in the United States didn't come from those those regions." And then my response was that I was, you know, whether they did or not, these are things that are in the imagination of African Americans. Mm -hmm right? We were kings and queens. Mansa Musa, is it there in the African-American imagination? It's in the diaspora imagination. So that's why I'm talking about Mali and, 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 and you know, and ancient Ghana, right? Less because, you know, we have evidence that people came from there who ended up in the United States. But, but you're right. We do hark back to these places, right? Regardless of whether they're in North Africa, we know they didn't come from Egypt, right? Or whether they came from Nubia or whether they came from Ghana or Mali, right? We're, we're, that's, an, that's an important part of how African-Americans have understood their connection to Africa. And this is, goes back to the original point when we were saying how individuals were writing history at a particular time. Like we yeah. could look at Du Bois's Africa and the world is dated, yeah. But he's engaged in a particular debate at the time, and he was making this case that Africa has a particular particular history comparable to, to Europe. Mm -hmm. But I think for an iteration of an African diasporic history now, we can speak to the, the current moment in, in ways that uh, would be generative. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think, I think I'm not... Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, you go right here. Right here. Oh, I was going to say, a lot of it is obviously problematic, um, and it's on one hand kind of... We, we can see some radicalism and then it can be really, really conservative. But we see the same contradiction in Garvey, for example. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's, and it's like, it's like religion, right? It's symbols. So um, you always have, you know, they're powerful, they represent something that is important and transformative. So we have to study it. Um, but on the other hand, it's, you know, deeply, conservative or problematic. Um, yeah. well, well, I think it, I agree with you there. And I think that it requires, uh, you know, a certain level of, I mean, I think our understanding of the ancients and the ancient world and so forth has developed and has progressed. Okay. And I think that we are probably at a place where we can have, um, uh, a more involved conversation with the complexities of these of these histories, and uh, you know, so that we can move beyond saying that you know we do have a predicate, we do have a historical predicate, but also begin to understand uh, a little bit more about what those what what that involved. For example, with respect to Ethiopia. Uh, I'm not an Ethiopianist, but, um, you know, um, we, there is a perspective on Ethiopia uh, outside of Ethiopia, and there's a perspective on Ethiopia within, mm -hmm. you yeah. know, and it, it, Ethiopia has an imperial, it has an, it, it's, it was an empire, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, yeah. you know, we have to kind of grapple with that. And it's important to grapple with that, right. you know? So, yeah. Well, uh, I want to thank our panelists, Professor Badesi, Prof Professor Blyden. You know, I'm just, 
we are in the we, we're just in the presence of royalty Dr. <laughs> Blyden. No, I'm serious about that. <laughs> Dr. Talton, we want to thank um Ms. Ms. Taylor for making all of this possible. Thank you, Ms. Taylor. Thank you. We want to thank uh, 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 Professor Alexander and Linda Day and Maura McLean and everyone else who has participated, Deborah Heard. I see that Allison Okuda uh, weighed in. So thanks to everybody. Uh, I thought that this was you know, generative, interesting. I love seeing everybody. Great. And I want to wish everyone uh, a, a wonderful remaining remainder of the day. This, the recording of this session will become available, will be available probably toward the end of the week. So thank everybody. Thank you, Dr. Everybody Gomez. Here.